All right, folks, Minmax Munchkin back uh, with another video. Today, uh, I wanted to finish one of my builds that I've been working on. But uh, in the meantime, I just decided, uh, heck no, it's kind of late. Uh, I know I'm not going to be able to finish it. So I'm going to talk about something that happened yesterday. Uh, well, actually, last night, uh, technically. So, it's actually a funny story. Um, I started DMing for these uh, guys that I play D&D with. Um, I made my own world, uh, sort of have like a macro cosmos of all things and uh, stuff like that. So, we got TPK'd in our previous campaign um, and somebody had to step in because the uh, previous DM uh, wasn't able to continue. Um, so I just decided to step in because uh, I had most of my big bones, big meaty parts of the skeleton of my campaign finished already and I just needed uh, like a couple of adventures to fill in some stuff, uh, especially because the players wanted to start from level 1, they really really wanted it, so my campaign was initially designed f around starting from level 3. Anyway. Long story short, um, without going into too many details, it's, a, it's, it's basically a story of what happened last night during the final encounter of the first, uh, let's call it chapter, well, first adventure. So basically the final fight, uh, the fight against, uh, let's call it a boss, um, they, they were a third level, uh, they somehow survived and in the uh, ensuing minutes... Uh, I don't know, maybe half an hour, hour of me talking uh, to the screen. Uh, you will find out all the details. So strap up, uh, get ready to grab some popcorns or some stuff. I don't know. Um, and uh, if you actually like me talking about something else other than uh, builds, optimizing your characters, making them super powerful and stuff like that. Um, you can go ahead and like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button right away. If not, then uh, stick f stick here for like a couple of minutes uh, and see what you think about this uh, whole story, this whole shebang. Alright, so here's the story. Uh, and I guess a few important lessons to all the new DMs out, out there from an equally or maybe even more newbie, inexperienced DM that is actually myself. Uh, so it's a story about overwhelming odds, roleplay... Uh, large perspective discrepancies between players and me as a DM. Uh, a healthy dose of min-maxing, obviously. Uh, optimization, tinkering with the uh, tinkering with and bending some rules that actually painfully uh, blew up right back into my face, uh, bite me into my butt. I kind of like nerfed myself. Uh, unforeseen circumstances, and most importantly, it was an evening session, like a nighttime session, full of fun, downright impossible, surprising, and hilarious low-level D&D action. Alright, so, before I even, like, started on, uh, uh, on, uh, during the, f after the climax of the TPK, we suffered in our previous campaign. I talked a little bit about my setting. Uh, I talked a little bit about my world, where they start, uh, some like kingdoms, important political, you know, all that shebang. Some, so I got in, a bit into religion and all of that stuff. Um, so I actually made it clear to the players that I'm, I'm actually going to railroad the first couple of sessions hard because it's, a, it's just much easier for me to put things into perspective as I'm fairly inexperienced as a DM. I actually tried DMing before. Uh, I, I ran a couple of one-shots. And I figured like a lot of misconception, misconceptions that I had um, actually affected my DMing uh, very, very badly. So I opted to change some of my things at least until the point I get more experience. DMing because it's a whole other ballpark than just playing D&D. So, <clears throat> after a certain point, I told them that all control of the direction they move uh, and, uh, y you know, like, stuff they do, they, it will be slowly delegated back into their hands. 
But for the time being, for the curve first, like three, four, maybe five, maybe even more, uh, depending on how fast they progress for the first couple of sessions, I'm going to railroad them, like put them on a path and they pretty much have no other choice to do but just that. Um, so they were mostly fine with it and said okay, gave me a green light and off we go. Let me also say that all of them are seasoned veterans, uh, a couple of them actually have like more than a decade of experience uh, on their tabletop RPG and uh, D&D belts. Uh, they've been playing like since editions first or second edition or stuff like that, like crazy stuff, since like 80s, 90s. Um, so yeah, like they've been playing a lot and I'm still fairly new to tabletop RPGs. I mostly grew up on PC games, PC RPGs and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, I made a transition, but I, I still don't have experience that they do. So I catch, I often catch myself uh, like uh, mumbling some stuff and uh, clumsily doing some stuff that they just like uh, effortlessly pass and breeze through. Uh, so, let's get back to the meat of the story. The campaign started in a small, recently established coastal city called Kandor, uh, which is managed by an immensely wealthy and powerful Arca Arcanum Consortium. Consortium. I actually don't know how it's pronounced. I just know how it's written. So, pardon my pronunciation. I'm not gonna bother checking it right now. Uh, basically, that consortium... Consortium? Whatever. Which, it trades primarily... In Arcanium, although it's called Arcanum, it, the the material they trade primarily is called Arcanium. Just a little bit of like a fluff lore of the world. The Arcanium is sort of like my own invention, nothing original. But it's basically a precious magic altering material that's used by wealthy rulers like nobles uh, and uh, just influential mages uh, to alter their magic, alter alter their spells uh, so yeah the altering is done all around if you can afford it and if you have enough influence or power um, so our freshly formed party of five level one adventurers uh, picks up this uh, 300 gold quest from the Arcanum Consortium city officials I'm going to try to avoid pronouncing that uh, word from now on because I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, Tabaxi Rogue, Turtle Monk, Turtle Arcana Cleric, Triton Sorcerer, and Tiefling Paladin. Uh, if you didn't notice uh, by now, all five characters' races start with the letter T. Also, you know how like Tieflings as a race often stick out due to their obvious fiendish demonic features they have because they are the offspring of demons and devils well let's just say in this particular party uh, the tiefling player actually sticks out sticks out the least because you have two giant massive massive walking turtles a tall lanky 2.5 meters like tall panther that walks on two legs and the humanoid fish basically also on two legs so yeah, the Tiefling is actually the most normal one of, of them all. So the weird party as it is uh, embarks on a quest uh, to, to get their first experience points, to loot their first uh, gold pieces, to kill their first uh, kobolds, wolves, whatnot. Anyway, the quest is actually very simple. Investigate and stop whoever or whatever is behind the increased rate of missing people and suspected, suspected abductions around the village called uh, Mifield, uh, where the rampant criminal activity from uh, nearby uh, bands of bandits and thugs, uh, as well as the abductions and stuff like that, are really, really causing a distress in that local area. Uh, the bandits and uh, criminals embark in their usual stuff, stealing, racketeering, extortion, the usual things. So the village is rough, uh, roughly two days of travel away from uh, Kandor. Uh, an important hint that I give to the players uh, right away while they are in Kandor, before they embark on a journey, 
uh, is that on the bulletin board where they read the um, the notice, the call for aid, call for heroes, call for mercenaries, adventurers to take the quest, they also notice uh, like uh, there are around 300 open job positions for naval guards, coastal rangers, as well as city and village guards. Uh, the Arcanum Consortium, again, uh, searches for a lot of uh, soldiers and uh, just guards to guard the local region. So basically, yeah, uh, prior to the final encounter of the first adventure, I'm going to kind of like very, very fast forward now. Uh, the players had their fair share of combat encounters with bandits, kobolds, uh, and all of those encounters eventually led them to figure out that kobolds are actually not allied with bandits and thugs and criminals, but they are rather competing for the same turf, and the kobolds are basically a new, right, like recently... Uh, major disturb a recent major major disturbing element uh, disturbing element in the in that local region so you basically add two and two together uh, the bandits are, are primarily uh, dealing in criminal activities that we already talked about like a minute ago while kobolds are most likely uh, they have something to do with with the missing people with a lot of missing people that are well, going missing lately. So, I make it very clear that the presence of kobolds alludes to the presence of something more draconic as well, because the lore of the world that they live in, the, the lore of my world, uh, they are, there are a lot of, like, stories, uh, there are a lot of fairy tales and uh, just legends and lore uh, that talks about these... Uh, small, uh, dra uh, draconic-looking creatures that are actually humanoids. I mean, I'm talking about kobolds, obviously. Uh, whenever they are they are present in larger numbers in certain region, most likely there's also a dragon somewhere hiding in the woods, mountains, or maybe even underground. Um, and yeah, basically it's a Dungeons and Dragons. So... It kind of has to have a freaking dragon from time to time, right? You cannot always fight, uh, I don't know, uh, mind flayers and uh, abolites and stuff like that. It's 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 dungeons and dragons. So I just put a freaking dragon uh, in their first adventure. Why not? I mean, why why not, right? So I'm not original. I'm very very copy paste, but fuck it, deal with it. Anyway, uh, again, I also make it clear that prior to the quest. The party uh, uh, signed themselves to like take on themselves and uh, try to accomplish uh, a garrison of village guards, uh, the village guard, the Mifield guards, embarked on a journey to investigate and end the crime, uh, criminal activity, and the, sp the supposed abductions, uh, like for for good. However, the garrison of these guards, uh, the, 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 uh, the brave souls, actually never came back, which left the village center poorly protected with just a skeleton crew of guards. Um, and surrounding farms and the farmlands are completely open and vulnerable to bandit raids, uh, criminals, uh, thugs, and uh, also abductions, obviously. People are going missing in that entire area. So, basically, after... I think it was like, actually, I actually forgot already, it was like two sessions in, yeah, anyway, doesn't matter. So after basically advancing, killing some, some fools, uh, chasing some criminals away, uh, chasing some kobolds away, finding uh, a young woman uh, lost in the woods crying for help, she was recently abducted and she pointed them out to, to the cave, which they actually found bandits. But later on, uh, they figure that the bandits actually uh, saved her from the kobolds, which obviously alluded to the fact that bandits and kobolds are actually enemies uh, between themselves. So yeah, anyway, after a little bit of that, a little bit of uh, this and that, uh, a little bit of multiclassing, a little bit of leveling up, uh, all of these characters uh, advance to level 3. 
they ultimately decide to go to this ruined summer shield fort that's basically uh, like uh, a relic of past times it's 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 an old archaic ancient fort which was once used to uh, to fend off the invaders but now stands largely uh, uninhabited abandoned and used by uh, people that actually don't want to live in organized society well not people it can be any type of human it's, uh, obviously you kind of get what I want to tell you with this right kobolds uh, anyway so two three days away from uh, the village of Mifeld there's that uh, summer shield fort uh, somewhere near the bottom of uh, the Black Mountain, I think it's Black Mountain, I, I already forgot, yeah, anyway, doesn't matter, um, names, names don't matter, so, that's where either the bandits, or kobolds, uh, will ultimately hold the, like, the supremacy over the criminal influence of the territory, so the players embark on, on the journey, they have to pass through the Emerald Wood first, which is like sort of this dark, gloomy place full of giant spiders and other horrors. You know, sort of like uh, Lord of Drinks. I'm like, you, I'm like copy pasting a lot of here. Just fucking deal with me. Okay, I'm not original with this stuff. But they said they were having fun. So it's all good. It's all good. You don't have to be fancy. Anyway, so I just copy paste all the tropes and usual stereotypes and fan fantastic elements. Just rip them out of a million other movies and books. Um, and in the critical moment of the spider lurking in the like uh, thick bush, I roll a natural one on a stealth check for a creature that has a plus seven to its stealth. In total, that's an eight. One plus seven, it, it's an eight. Nobody in a party has uh, passive perception lower than ten, obviously. Uh, because passive perception is one of those uh, perception in general is one of those skills that most players take. It's kind of like it's it's kind of like those staple optimizing things that most players that know what to do actually do. So yeah, uh, everybody notices that spider, giant spider. It's kind of like a bag of hit points, 20, 30 hit points. Not not a lot of uh, AC, not a lot of movement speed, not a lot of damage. Just like on its own, not very scary, but uh, in uh, in like in like a bunch more of them, they can be very scary. I roll initiative, they roll initiative. Um, all but one of them roll the higher initiative than me. Actually, well, the spider. And obviously, while the spider is just uh, sitting there waiting to be killed, they just proceed, come one by one next to it, murder it mercilessly. Before the poor spider could even attempt to run away. Uh, so after that quick act of violence, let's just say the word got out on the interwebs. Uh, a full pun totally intended. Because uh, spiders do have interwebs even in fantasy worlds. There's interwebs. Uh, anyway, yeah, I actually uh, wrote that joke right into the ground. I face planted it right with my nose. Uh, so that, you know, the word got out on the interwebs, you got catch my point, that some unknown five scary humanoids, new five scary humanoids are passing through, murdering everything that moves. Uh, and basically keep your creepy crawly offspring safely tucked somewhere deep below the ground in the burrows far away from the danger. And from that point on, uh, since the point they just mercilessly murder hobo that spider the players actually just uh, proceed to safely trek uh, in the mid through the middle of the forest uh, walking down the path uh, nothing happens until uh, they come very very near to the fort to the summer shield fort where the, the actual final encounter is about to happen uh, and uh, as they move along the road, they encounter a band of flying kobolds, you know, those winged kobolds, I actually don't know if you know about them, but it's basically just uh, uh, a, a little bit uh, more powerful kobold than the usual kobold, with a, has flying speed, has wings, a uh, little bit more stats, and basically all the same. Uh, so yeah, a bunch of those, uh, and uh, one ogre uh, in front of them, 
absolutely wrecking all the small uh, undergrowth uh, bushes, trees in front of him. And they, all of them, like a band, uh, an ogre and uh, kobolds are chasing down a giant elk through these thick bushes. The bushes and the undergrowth and uh, the all of that stuff is very, very thick. Uh, it's basically a difficult terrain. Uh, I, maybe it wasn't a giant elk, maybe it was a moose. I actually don't know, it doesn't even matter. So, yeah, anyway. The players also notice something or someone, small quickly disappearing into the thick brushwood mere seconds before the ogre and the kobolds catch up to their prey and stab it to death. Um, now, that something or someone is actually a sixth uh, player character, a bard, one, ranger, two, goblin, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a party without a single human on an elf. It's, it's a very fun party. I'm gonna have a loads of fun DMing for them. I'm actually not sarcastic, it's very fun to DM. Because they're all weird. It's like a walking fish, a walking cat, two walking turtles, and a small goblin. And the tiefling, like half demon. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, uh, we, for this, for his character, for like my campaign, we decided to use uh, revised ranger mechanics. That you can find here on this wiki. I mean, I actually don't know what the status of, the, the status of this wiki is. It's like it has all the information. Most of it is accurate. Uh, and I actually don't know how it works with like copyright. It's very weird. Uh, because it's basically just information directly taken from the books. Which are copyrighted, right? So, anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, he basically decided to take the Beast Conclave uh, when he levels up in time obviously um, and because the beast master the beast conclave in this in this like uh, ed edition of the ranger build is much much better than the uh, stock one that you get in player's handbook because frankly the player's handbook beast master which is sort of like uh, uh, similar to beast conclave should be the same thing is much much like, much, much worse. Like, uh, it's basically shit tier uh, subclass. So, yeah, we basically decide to take uh, this and he takes this. Like, this ranger has a little bit... Like, the other abilities, the basic class abilities are a little bit better. I'm not gonna go too much into it. So, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> anyway, uh, through some brain and brawn... Uh, this musically gifted bounty hunter... Sneaked around the bushes and underwoods and stuff like that. Now remember, that is difficult terrain. But for Ranger, who has a, nat a natural explorer, uh, you he just ignores difficult terrain. He doesn't care. He just speeds through like thick under br like brushwood, under undergrowth, and uh, thick bushes and stuff like that. He just speeds through it like it's not even there. So he's just speeding around while kobolds and uh, the ogre are trying to catch up to him. The players are actually very, very tactically um, playing that encounter in a way to like, they completely scatter out the kobolds. They completely outplay and outsmart the dump sack of giant kin hit points that is ogre, obviously. And the scattered kobolds just break rank, uh, lose direction, kind of get nervous, get a bit scared, try to like move away because they are only uh, brave in numbers and when you isolate them they are very very cowardly. So yeah, they just pick them off one by one. It's basically kind of like a medium encounter but they just, they don't waste like, a, they, they, they almost waste nothing on it, like pretty much nothing. Um couple of arrows and darts and stuff like that gets lost in the bushes but like it, that that stuff is easily replenishable um so yeah uh, after the, that quick uh, encounter all six of them meet up quickly afterwards and the gob they actually like get friendly very quickly uh it's just like uh, they for the first time they see this goblin they just okay here you are and he tells them like that uh, He's been scouting around the fort for several several days. He's like this bounty hunter that was sent to uh, investigate the rumors of kobold presence in the area. 
Um, he was like sent by some private investigators. Uh, and basically he's been scouting the area and even managed to capture and kill two kobolds on his own. Um, so now there are six players in the party. It's a party of six level three players. A sword clock, basically like your typical sword clock with like sorcerer, warlock, shenanigans. A hexadin, a hexblade paladin. A drunken master, monk, arcana cleric, wizard. Uh, the cleric is actually, I think at this point, level two and wizard is level one. Uh, don't quote me on that. I, I actually don't, I won't bother checking. Uh, there's Assassin, Rogue, level 3, obviously, and a Bard, 1, Ranger, 2, Multiclass, Goblin, in the party. They all have, like, cool, flavorful, homebrewed magic items, which I gave them uh, at the beginning of the campaign, because I kind of designed the campaign around level 3, so I already, like, devised a lot of these magic items that I'm gonna give away. Uh, to the players uh, depending on the class and race choices So I just decided well screw it who cares. I'm gonna give them these magic items at level one anyways What what difference is gonna make? It's like all basically not like your typical magic items you find in DM's guide Like I just made this homebrew stuff and I think it's actually really fun So more about that later at this at this like one point one of those magic items is really gonna like steal the spotlight uh, so from this point onward, uh, I borrow heavily, he I borrow like heavily from the Dragon Prince adventure you can download for free from the DM's Guild uh, guide uh, or what's what's it called? DM's Guild website. So it's basically like a free, uh, get it free, you can, I think you can even donate, I don't know where the button is. But you basically get it for free, it's, it's like, it, it's kind of designed for like a little bit more newbie characters. But I primarily used it because it like perfectly meshed with my own idea of uh, like the, how the story unfolds. It basically had all the all the areas laid out. Like I only had to make some maps and stuff like that later on. Like took me like half an hour, an hour maybe. So I basically I wasted almost no time on those like complicated encounters and stuff like that. I only just like changed some numbers. And uh, spent a bit of time like uh, tinkering with some magics. Uh, so let so yeah. From that point onward, I borrow heavily, change some stuff. Ob I leave like 60, 70 percent of adventure intact, and those 30, 40 percent is actually like those critical little little touches, uh, which like just add a little bit more like um, immersion into the world, like make the world more more believable, more real. Um, yeah, so anyway, they, the players slowly, tactically move towards the Broken Stone Bridge that's leading up to the fort, like, at this slight inclination, like, slight... Uh, it's not very steep, but it still goes up. Uh, it's not, like, uh, horizontal. So, yeah, taking full advantage of the Kobold's sunlight sensitivity, they creep up to uh, the uh, Kobold's that are... They, like standing guard uh, in front of the fort They kill four out of five kobold guards that are outside the fort Now, I mean these are like your cannon fodder kobolds with five or seven HP um, Which basically like one hit kill uh, But still uh, there's one priestly looking kobold with a little bit more HP some spells and uh, That one manages to flee that one manages to, to survive uh, runs into the fort, warns his allies inside that the intruders are incoming and uh, basically pre prepares everybody inside for the fight. So this fort is like not very big, it's not very like, it's not massive, it's like 60 feet wide, 50 feet long, it's like almost not a fort, it's almost like the size of an outpost, but it's kind of like just a little bit bigger than your usual outpost. So it's kind of like very very small fort. Or very very large outpost. So yeah, 60 feet wide, 50 feet long, uh, some uh, 50 kind of 50-ish feet high, two floors inside. So the players decide to push on and inside the fort. I actually, I think I actually have the map of that uh, fort, sort of like the bird's eye perspective. Yeah, kind of like that's what it is. Um, very very not very good, but 
you get the point that like th this is where kobolds were. I kind of like changed some of the stuff for my um, for my uh, area for the month. Basically, there's no sea. All of this is sea, but uh, in my world, there's like all of this is mountain. So yeah, I obviously adapted the material to my own setting. So the players decide to push on, get inside the fort. They have their first medium to hard encounter with like a challenge rating 2 lizard folk druid. Uh, his pet crocodile, which is like challenge rating one, one half, I think. Uh, they lurk beneath the magic, well not magic, just like uh, three feet of, uh, of water that is like res a mini pool in the middle of the ground floor which is like slightly, it has like a slight dip into it. Uh, so, and a bunch of kobolds obviously on the floor above, uh, land and air kobolds like winged and uh, uh, basic ones. So they have like that medium to hard encounter. I expect them to wipe it out. Uh, the monk, uh, the turtle monk actually drops to zero hit points. Because at one point he gets ganged up by like all seven or eight flying kobolds out there. But yeah, the rest of the party has minimal damage, minimal casualties. And uh, But I do manage to waste some of their resources. Uh, because I actually planned for that. Up until this point, this is all, all going by plan. I'm all like, okay, this is going well. I'm doing good. They are like taking my bait. I'm railroading them. Just as I said that I would. It's all going well, but just wait. Uh, the monk drops to zero, basically. They revive him, bring him up to some hit points. They, uh, I expect them to take rest. Uh, and note to any DM out there, Gust of Wind, a spell called Gust of Wind, can actually be very fun to use, very useful to use in combat, even though it kind of has very limited combat effect. Uh, but if you are a little bit creative, a little bit imaginative, I think you can figure out many, many ways to make this spell worthwhile. Uh, this is the spell that Tritons get for free. They can cast it one time, one time per day. But I'm just saying, if if whenever the player actually you, takes this spell for whatever for whatever reason, yeah, you can do stuff with this. It's it, it can be fun. Anyway, they proceed to investigate the dead bodies a bit afterwards on the dead lizard body, lizard folk's body uh, that's floating in the water. Somebody rolls like a super high uh, investigation check. And finds easy to follow instructions on how to open the secret. But now they are actually not so secret at all. Heavy stone revolving door inside the mountain cavern. Which is situated somewhere, well positioned somewhere on the second floor. Unbeknownst to the players. A single flying like winged kobold opened the secret door right before the rest of his kobold buddies charged below. And warned their uh, warned the sizable kobold den inside about the presence of unwanted intruders inside the fort. Let me just just keep, just stand stand there. Uh, and here's actually where my troubles begin to unfold because I'm not experienced at this, and I thought I was leading them very very well up until this point, but things began to complicate here uh, here like w here's what happened before they opened the door themselves I fully expected them to take a short rest because they were wounded they they uh, spent some spell slots a short rest would actually uh, benefit a lot of players in the party uh, due to a lot of them having some short rest dependent mechanics uh, but no uh, after about five minutes of just wandering around and trying to find like whatever, uh, the freaking drunken monk just randomly decides to throw a monkey wrench in my wicked evil DM plans. So after the initial scuffle in the fort, obviously, uh, after a bit of like five, maybe ten minutes, just like very, 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 very little time, uh, he, the turtle monk, the turtle monk, just nonchalantly presses the small stone, uh, the small brick 
in the corner of these doors and opens these secret doors, door, whatever, plural, singular, I don't know. Um, I look at him and say, you do that, huh? And he looks back and says, yes. I just like, I, I stand there for like a second, look down and say, oh boy, here we go. What happens, happens. It's showtime now. But, yeah, I mean, I obviously said something like that. I didn't say it like it is, and I didn't say it in English. But you get my point. Uh, a bit later, I actually said to them, I really thought that you would take a short rest before opening the door. I actually said that to him. To them. And the monk player, the same one that opened the door, just chuckled, like, laughed in my face and said, I don't know why you thought that, because there's no way we don't open the goddamn door. Right away, right. And I, I just said fair enough, uh, because uh, I like thought to myself, it's all in the hands of D20s now, because the D20s are gonna decide everything now, because it's 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 like literal chaos now. And boy, it actually was a chaos. Um, but looking back at it from like this perspective and thinking about it a little bit, I think about it as I'm talking about it right this moment. This was probably, like, the single most brilliant thing they could have done during that whole ordeal in, in that fort. And here's why. So, there's, like, an uber-deadly den of kobolds inside. I mean, you obviously, you can read from the title of this video. You actually know what it is. So, yeah, I mean, basically, if they go inside, they're dead. But it caught them off guard. Uh, the fact that they opened these doors, uh, because, like, due to the fact that all of this is happening in the middle of the freaking day, like, it's, 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 it's noon, it's like, the sun is up there in the sky, it's like, glaring, it's very hot, um, kobolds are primarily nocturnal creatures, they even have, like, this sunlight sensitivity trait, um, which basically just says that they suck on, under the sunlight, um, they, uh, yeah, I mean, they're nocturnals, most of their kobolds, like, most of the, the, the deadly den of kobolds is actually sleeping at the point they barge into the fort. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the rest of them that are not sleeping, obviously, they are outside maybe chasing prey or some, like, are cooking stuff and maybe eating, maybe taking guard, whatever. But most of them are sleeping because they are nocturnal. So they engage in these like villager abduction practice, ab abduction practices. It's actually hard to pronounce that. Mostly during the night time. Uh, it actually like it even like mostly happens during the night time. It's what it's what the players like got told. Uh, so the kobolds, as the kobolds are, they lack any military prowess required to wake up, pull ranks, and get fully battle ready for the incoming fight uh, in like five minutes they, they they need like half an hour they're like very disorganized like little cackling nervous ang anxious creatures that are very scared and cowardly and they need somebody to like slap them and tell them stand there and shut the fuck up uh, so yeah they need at least half an hour in the best case scenario to pull everybody inside get battle ready prepare the terrain uh, that half an hour is the half an hour they don't have. That half an hour is the half an hour I didn't count on them not having. I literally didn't think of it. Uh, I just thought, okay, players gonna have like a hard encounter. They're gonna short rest and we move on. So at this point I'm thinking, well, okay, they are sleeping. I mean, obviously they cannot wake up. In like, wake, they can wake up in five minutes, but they cannot get ready. Um, the players open the doors, there's still like some, uh, like those cannon fodder, uh, uh, freaking, what's, what, what they're called, uh, kobolds inside, a uh, little bit like, there are, there are these, these guys as well, um, these dragon shields as well, which have like a lot of HP, they're actually a little bit scary, uh, I didn't like, I didn't use them fully, I removed their dragon resistance, because it would be just too much, uh, like, the players would have, like, no chance then. Uh, but, uh, still, uh, they are, they are, they are forced to be reckoned with, and they, they really wrecked them. 
so yeah, they're standing guard, they're standing duty at the end of the entrance tunnel, and at this point I'm gonna open my map, and I'm gonna talk about it. So, yeah, th this is, this is what we see, like, they open the door, these are like revolving doors, they, uh, they rotate around like one axis in the middle of the entrance. And basically, as you open these doors, uh, let me see, uh, this like whole area becomes like, basically these are the doors, right, when they are open. And this like a very, very, very large ogre here, uh, watching guard, awake, uh, when the players open, he just turns around and goes, uh, um, and basically these are the kobolds here that are standing guard and we are not gonna even like bother with this stuff over there for now because like all of these are actually here. Um, and even these ones here. Well, these ones are like preparing food, so they are not. So, like, But most of these are like sleeping around here. So, not, not most, but all of them. Yeah, anyway, so these are the kobolds that are ready uh, just like at all times. And this is the ogre. And they proceed... Uh, the ogre actually, um, this like very very fat, very very large, almost huge in size, but not quite, it's still like a large creature. Uh, so he moves around and uh, my friend is calling me and I have to actually not respond. Um, because I actually want to finish this video. Yeah, anyway, so the largest ogre uh, they have ever seen stands guard. Uh, and uh, he's very fat, has a heck ton of hit points, has 10 feet mil reach, hits like a truck, and his skin is, well, let's just say, like, seasoned, and basically he has a little bit higher armor class. I just, like, bumped his stats up a little bit, made him, like, sort of a challenge rating 3 creature. So he lets out this loud roar, uh, launches the only ja javelin he has in his hands toward the tiefling hexadin, uh, the like the most unnoticeable guy he hits him, but now all he has left is a terrifying looking great club So the players decide to stay at the entrance blinking at the ogre from the safe distance Due to the thick stone revolving doors that are around here um, And due to those doors uh, and ogres immense size uh, Nearing that of a huge creature. I actually kind of pre-designed pre-planned this encounter around him not being able to like uh, slide past these doors these like doors yeah so uh yeah it's he's just like a nuisance who picks rocks from the floor and uh hits the players with them um but actually i think that was a big mistake maybe not a big but definitely was a mistake i i, I should just like follow the rules put the large creature there give it a little bit like a stat bump make it like a little bit harder to kill and, uh, yeah, I mean, I should just follow the rules, let the large creature be able to squeeze through the medium-sized uh, hole, like it's even written in rules. In other words, at this point, he's like more or less a useless bag of hit points, thanks to my pointless bending of the rules, which I uh, uh, stubbornly decided to hold uh, th till the end of the session. So these kobolds here, obviously, like this, like 30 movement speed is like 60. They come here like one round. In the second round, they start uh, swarming the guys. Uh, this encounter right here, like these three kobold dragon shields with 44 hit points, 15 armor class, like uh, 1d6 plus 2 damage, I think. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, 1d8 plus, it's like 1d6, yeah, like, it's a lot of damage. Uh, they actually, like, they decide to fling their spears, because they are a little bit, uh, they're like freshmen. Uh, and, uh, yeah, these spears end up in one of the players, I think it was the, the tabaxi, and he just ran away, and <laughs> those were the only spears they had. They still had two, two meal attacks, two, like, uh, if they still had multi-attack. But they attacked with uh, with their fists. Now, granted, I mean, I could have maybe that was I could have I maybe kind of helped the players. I didn't plan for this to do. I at the, at like at that point in at that point of time, it just like made sense to like launch the, those spears. Uh, but looking back at it, I should have just kept the spears, waste waste one more round of the movement, and uh, reach the players in round three. 
But yeah, anyway, they do that, and the encounter on its own is actually deadly. If you put the, put the numbers in there and stuff, deadly encounter is like at 2.4, like 2400 experience points. And this was somewhere around 3000. So, yeah, uh, terrain is helping them, but encounter on paper is very, very hard. Um, so yeah, the three, the three dragon shields and seven sling flingers uh, arrive and they are very effective at what they do for a while. Abuse their pack tactics feature to the fullest, the racial trait. I seemingly cannot roll below 18 on initiative rolls. Like all of my monsters at this point are 18. They all rolled 18, 19 or 20 on their initiatives. So like during those first turns, they just like, Kind of like got a little bit of advantage. Um, not too much, but still like they were first to play. A deadly encounter. Party still washes the floor with the cobalt blood. I mean, through some clever positioning and using the door as a bottleneck. I obviously intended, intended these doors to be like this to just enable the players to have like a little bit more even uh, ground against this force right here. Um, so... Even though, uh, like, they kill uh, these uh, kobolds and stuff, like, they just, like, slaughter them here. The two kobold inventors come around the corner, stay there, like, they, like, come around here. Uh, like, those are these dudes right here. They were, like, sleeping here. Now they are awake. They just, let, just ignore all this here. It doesn't exist for a while. Um, they just, like, come here, like, two, three rounds. And uh, they, walk, they, like, look at this here, like, cold giant. The, the the ogre like tell him to follow them and they move back and regroup uh, because uh, yeah I mean those inventors are kind of clever I think um, let me see I actually think they have like yeah they have eh, it's like eight intellect seven wits not very clever but clever enough to figure out that they need to move away and not attack like willy nilly so yeah uh, I make sure to describe that uh, the metallic wooden and glass noises from all of this shit they are carrying uh, on their backs is like making noises and they are not only hearing like the ogres and kobolds steps but they are hearing, hearing like a bunch of other metallic wooden glass noises like uh, clay noises coming from the direction uh, from uh, where, like where the winged co the those in kobold inventors came to so, yeah, I mean, that happens. Still going mostly as planned. Uh, because, yeah, okay, they just slaughtered one encounter I kind of didn't expect them to do. But at this point, they are very, very hurt. Uh, they are very low on hit points. They wasted a lot of their spell slots. They need that short rest. And uh, they are doing that short rest. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm getting closer to them actually retreating now. Because I want them... To run away from the fort, come back another day, and just like the war of attrition, the kobolds, and just kill them like in several ways. Um, yeah, so the instructions the players have picked up off of the dead lizard folk's body in the water on the ground floor uh, only explains how to open the revolving door, not close it. So, the party pulled their combined wits, magic and strength uh, in an attempt to close the, the heavy stone door. Which, by the way, it can only be reliably and effortlessly closed from the inside. Uh, a DC-10 investigation or perception check is uh, basically what's keeping them uh, from finding that brick that's used, like you, you push and close the doors. Door. Uh, and it's actually not that hard to notice it because the ogre that's like standing here most of the day uh, occasionally engages like this like brick button pressing activity to kill his boredom so he left more than a few dirty marks on the brick right nevertheless the players figure out a super cool DC 15 to 20 workaround way that I put in place to semi forcefully Close the door from the outside without pressing the brick on the inside. Of course, they totally roll low 
uh, on some of those rolls, destroy the closing mechanism completely, snap off the spike, uh, spike like uh, the, the spiky stuff at the tip of the spears uh, from one of the dragon shield spears. They badge it hard inside, the, the, like the thin slit between the door and the door frame. And like they, they make the whole thing like stuck in place, like seemingly unable to open, open again. Uh, after that, like they're watching, and I kind of like okay, I followed their logic, but still, it's like wow. Uh, after that, they just like take the short rest right inside that freaking fort, that's like teeming with goblins inside the cavern. Right, like the the, the fort is leading directly into that cavern. And they know there are more there are more kobolds inside. They just sit down, take their short dress, like there's no words in the world. And I'm like thinking, I mean, wh wh what? Like they they do that. They decide to do that. So I'm like thinking, they just had a very hard encounter. I clearly hinted there are more kobolds inside, but no, they just drop down and take their short dress. I mean, I can understand the logic, but on the other hand, I mean, come on, guys, like. Your experience of this game that's what I'm thinking that's clearly not what they're thinking and that's clearly why they have more experience than me so they close the door blah 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 all of that uh, obviously they don't know about the other entrances from the other end of the cavern I can't really blame them for that if they knew about that I mean maybe that would affect their decision Nevertheless, uh, I feel like at this point I have to start improvising a lot I, I have to like Abandon the script that I wrote on the paper literally and figuratively and Because it clearly all got out of control and they're all about to die and I don't actually want them to die I actually want them to survive Figure out like finish the quest do it in a way that I kind of envisioned to happen uh, And yeah, I mean, I just don't want to f I don't want to freaking kill them so, out of my ass, I quickly figure that, uh, like, three out of five remaining winged kobolds inside the den who just woke up. Uh, in an attempt to spy on them from the outside, they, like, fly out of the other entrance. Like, there's another well-hidden entrance where, like, exit, well, regardless what you, however you think, uh, into or outside of the cavern system on the opposite the end of that cliff. Uh, that the fort is like leaning onto so the red dragon vermling uses that uh, entrance to get in and out and sometimes even lets his flying servants the winged kobolds use that entrance as well uh, the ground bound kobolds like the inventors and those other kobolds can't really use this exit they can only use these doors that the players are short resting at this moment right in front of uh, because it's too steep and deadly drop down like more than a hundred feet and they would all die uh, So only flying gets you quickly in and out of that entrance But still it's like a perfect entrance and exit for a dragon and uh, winged kobolds So of course they come there and I roll five on a stealth check the party notices there's something outside uh, Like they notice a shadow uh, quickly go past the window slits the monk speeds towards the narrow window, flings a dart into the kobold he sees clinging on the right side of the wall. He does roll low on a damage die, but all three kobolds obviously get startled, fly away in fear. And I'm thinking at this point, alright now, it's painfully obvious there's at least three other kobolds that came at you from somewhere else, but not through the doors. And that there's an unknown number of kobolds still alive inside and trying to get to the party. I told them about the metallic noises and you, they know there's a still an ogre inside and they are wounded, damaged. They still have half an hour to, to finish the short rest. So yeah, I mean, I do let them to take the short rest because there's no quick shortcut for the majority of like there's no shortcut for the majority of kobold then uh, to get to their current position there just isn't it's either a door or the entrance for the winged creatures they indeed pick up the hint that I carefully lay uh, like in front of them but to my absolute astonishment they finish the short rest forcefully open the door again and I'm like I'm like I'm, I'm literally 
freaking out right now. I'm thinking there's no way they survived this. There's no fucking way. So they open the door forcefully and just like barge in. And I'm speechless. I don't know what the fuck to do. Uh, the kobolds now had more than enough time to get ready to fight. It's been an hour. They, they are all woken up. They are ready to fight. The only two choices I have at this point are to either... Like that's what I'm thinking. Are to either significantly dumb down the encounter on the fly. To like... Just like make it possible for them to survive from my perspective. Uh, thinking like... But on the other hand, like, the players, like, if they encounter something that they kill after this much effort and this much damage that they already sustained, they might think, like, what? Are you telling me, like, these fools abducted all of these villagers and killed the garrison and all, all of those trained soldiers? Like, bitch, please, something else is amiss here. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, like, that my players are gonna think that in the future if I make the encounter much easier the other option is just let it play out as it is accept the like the fate tpk the players kill all of them fuck it start over so they wander they wander in uh explore around a bit uh at this point i'm gonna switch back to the map here and i'm gonna explain a little bit of things so Here's like this rubble here, and there's like a very, very Picasso artistic style uh, paint, paintless presentation here of how it looks from like the perspective of the players. So there's these, uh, obviously none of these kobolds here are alive anymore, there's only this stuff right here, more on that later. So these are like three barricades, wooden barricades uh, that are like, kind of like five by five. In dimensions, they take one of these, like, uh, medium-sized um, rectangles. Or, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So, yeah, there's, like, barricades there. They pro they provide half cover. And there's, like, a whole blocked wall of rubble, uh, collapsed huge blocks of stone, boulders, and uh, just, like, uh, a collapsed b a support beam that the kobolds instructed the ogre who is now actually not here but let me just quickly move him uh, away from here and put him where he is he's like there uh licking his wounds he figured out after like half an hour after he finished his work here that he should actually like lick his wounds take in 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 like in translation short rest Unfortunately, he won't have enough time to short rest, so that's that also that that's also a factor that played because he at this point he had like 20, 30 HP out of like 90 hit points. So yeah, it, it, like all of those things slowly combined and ultimately led to something that I actually didn't fucking expect. It can even happen. Um, so yeah, act, so that happens. Obviously, uh, moving back to the paintless thing. So this is. Uh, all right. For some reason, this like magic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, magic. Okay, okay. okay. So this is like what's ha what happened. Um. This right here is like natural rubble, rubble stone boulders that naturally fell down uh, when the ogre uh, smacked those support beams and just like collapsed that part of the passage. Unfortunately, the passage is around 20 feet tall and the rubble, the debris, the gravel, the boulders are not high enough to cover the entire entrance. Like, half of the entrance is completely open and the players can freely move uh, move uh, across, of the, across this. So, there's this material that I already talked about called Arcanium, Arcanium and it enhances, it uh, alters magic. It alters spells, obviously. So one of these kobolds is actually a sorcerer, <clears throat> who I uh, changed a little. Like I changed his spells. I uh, because he's a sorcerer, he can like unlearn one of the spell and learn additional second level spell whenever he levels up. And he is obviously a third level spellcaster. So I picked up, picked out his expeditious retreat, which also affected the encounter by the end because he couldn't expeditiously retreat and yeah i gave him levitate and levitate basically uh enabled the, the 
uh, this sorcerer cobalt to he spent all of the arcanium all while like 100 arcanium to pick like dozens hundreds of sto like big stones boulders and just like rocks and gravel and uh, magically placed it on top of the naturally uh, natural rubble and boulders below so basically this like 10 feet of height is normal rubble and 10 feet on top is like magic levitating uh, a wall of doom basically he is concentrating levitation is a concentration spell he is levitating that thing for like the next 24 hours because that's what happens when you when you like infuse the levitate with arcanium and uh, yeah I mean that thing is just floating right there and there's a strong possibility that the players are just gonna die uh, once they come approach that wall and the sorcerer figures out the players are on the other side of the wall and levitates and just drops the rocks on them. There's a very real possibility of that happening. I actually planned for that to be possible. Uh, regardless of like it, there, there has to be a risk. Um, but I actually did mention that there are like slits here like tiny holes the size of those tiny holes is enough that small creatures like kobolds and a goblin and remember there's a goblin in a party can pass through is like they can they can squeeze through it uh, obviously like 15 and 20 feet on top it's too high to even like climb there but yeah that that's about it so like from the bird's eye perspective this takes about 5 to 10 feet of area around here not fully but closely some like this this part right here is a bit thinner and these parts here like are, are a bit like they are a bit more scattered a bit more like spread around so yeah that's about it <clears throat> also this part right here is like uh, uh ogre's den which is like full of uh, hundreds of uh beast humanoid bones rotting flesh they even notice like a, a, a few pairs of uh, humanoid skeletons of like clearly and like not adults like clearly kids so yeah i mean this goblin eats this uh, this uh, ogre eats little children so that's what that's basically what ogres do right they're just evil creatures um so yeah i mean it's it's full of stench vomit inducing uh, full of shit uh, full of like feces stuff like that but like they notice a small hole right here they notice one of these kobolds who sneak through this like small uh small passage small tunnel uh they use this tunnel to bring ogre the food by the way uh this is like uh, a huge a huge cauldron of cooking food um yeah he's like standing there because he heard some noises and he was like trying to stay there he rolled very very poorly on stealth the party the first uh, guy to, to get in is a tiefling he noticed the kobold there killed him actually didn't tell the party what he did but yeah i mean they kind of noticed later on the goblin quickly uh just like ran through this passage right here saw the one uh, one other kobold here saw the ogre here Unfortunately, the goblin uh, rolled bad on stealth and they noticed him back, so he just quickly ran, ran back and uh, joined the party back again. Um, yeah, so after hearing about like a good chunk of his minions dying at the entrance tunnel uh, previously, uh, the dragon, which like this is this is his kind of like lair. Uh, like a passage to his lair uh which is which has dragon horde obviously dragons have dragon's horde uh he like ordered the com he ordered the kobolds and the ogre to build this wall uh the whole thing is basically an intricate house of cards but only made of boulders heavy stones and gravel instead of like an actual cards it's obviously mundane at the top uh, un at the bottom and magical at the top it wasn't impenetrable 
by any means. Mage Hand could wobble the top part of the wall, for example. Players could pick up some clues. Uh, Levitate, which is a second level spell. There was a possibility some of the party members would learn that spell, for example. Um, yeah, Levitate would, for example, wobble this, probably even destabilize this whole thing, like make it just crumble down. There were ways to like just knock this thing out you know, without too much danger. Um, on the other hand, it actually wasn't really obvious that the top half of the wall was magically glued together either. Because there were about a dozen or so tiny holes below, a bit of like tiny holes above, but the whole area is like dark. There isn't too much light going through at this like part of the den. Because it's too far from the entrance and it's too far from this entrance. So, like, there's no way for, for any sunlight, daylight to come through other than the fire. For example, there was a fire here, but it, it, it it's complete darkness. And if they can turn on their torches and the cast a light country, but they take a risk with that. So, yeah, it's not entirely obvious this whole shebang, this whole structure is actually magical at the top. Um... So yeah, there were about a, there. They were those holes. They were big enough for tiny creatures to sque squeeze through. Dark vision obviously notices those holes. Light notices those those holes. Uh, I'm thinking if they somehow do manage to survive this levitating wall of inevi inevitable doom, like a quadruple deadly encounter is waiting for them on the other side of that wall of boulders. And there's no way to survive that. Like it's it's like four times the deadly. Like one deadly encounter has the potential to kill the party. Four times deadly, it's like with nothing to talk about. But let's just see what happens. Introducing the majestic, uh, fabulous cantrip called Mold Earth, which I just didn't think about at all. Like, it didn't even cross my mind that this can, this shitty little cantrip can crumble my ingenious uh, construction of magical doom shit. Just make it fall down. So yeah, read, basically, it's on the screen, you can read it yourself. Uh, basically, the gravel, dirt and stone that... that uh, was inside of that rubble, uh, the cleric could cast the cantrip on it and just move one portion on it, destabilize the entire structure because the magic portion of the wall on top was actually sitting on the mundane non-magical portion of the wall at the bottom because there wasn't enough arcanium material to make the levitate spell support the entire weight of that like magically... Uh, constructed wall, magically transmuted wall, uh, whatever. <clears throat> so yeah, like the whole thing was like a house of cards, like if you move one big chunk of that uh, bottom part of the wall, the whole thing can crumble. Um, so yeah, lo and behold, uh, this is what happens. The arcane cleric ba uh, cast, already cast mold earth like 5 to 10 minutes prior to that. He actually sealed uh, the whole uh, this tiny little hole in the in the in the uh, ogre's den with mage can with uh, mold earth. He just picked up all this trash, bones, dirt, uh, gravel, st rocks, and he just put it right there, right there, right there. And he was like a fresh of like his thoughts were fresh of using that cantrip because he just cast it, and like. They moved around a little bit, they did make a little bit of noise, uh, if they even had like a light cantry point, but it all happened very quickly. Um, in a span of like a 10 to 20 seconds uh, uh, that the kobolds noticed them, started like trying to figure out what to do because they didn't know when the players are gonna come, right? And even the kobold sorcerer was waiting from the instructions from the uh, dragon and from the priest kobold, which was like the chief of that entire kobold then, what to do, and even like they didn't know what exactly to do, because it, it was just like a light cantrip, with rays of that cantrip protruding from the tiny holes into the wall. 
10 to 20 seconds pass. They kind of like move a little bit around, try to move some stones, make a little bit of noise. The cleric, the turtle cleric wizard announces, I cast mold earth. And from this point onward, the entire shit goes down, like down the drain. I have to improvise everything because I didn't prepare for this. And I stop for a second without too much thinking about what to do. I decide right there to right there and then to roll a d6 dice die to see which side of the wall uh, the the part of the top wall is going to collapse. On one to three, half of the upper wall would drop towards the cobalt side. On six, on four to six, it would drop to to player side. Basically, drop onto their heads. Um, whatever happens, happens. I just said whatever happens, happens. I roll two. Okay, that's it. okay, that's fine. Uh, not sure what to think of it though yet, because half of the upper wall leans a bit towards the cobalt side, momentarily collapses, dust and rubble scatters around across 10, 10 by 10 feet area. Uh, just like this whole thing crumbles and makes like all of this thing right here is like now a difficult terrain. Um, even like this thing right here is like difficult terrain, I think. But with the Mold Earth cantrip, he actually makes a slight opening here. Um, and because, yeah, I mean, he just moved the entire structure. And this heavily affects the battle flow. So, uh, the, uh, wh wh what was I, uh, th what was my train of, train of thought? Okay, 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 I know. Uh, not sure, like, what to think about it. Have the like all, all thing crumbles later. I figure out that I actually completely forgot to roll like just a basic DC 10 constitution saving throw for the cobalt sorcerer to maintain his concentration on the other part of this wall Which was still standing the the part of that magic wall was still standing. I Forgot to roll that I mean I should have rolled that because it only makes sense to do it uh, I forgot, but let's just let's just pretend that I did roll it, and I rolled an eight because a cobalt sorcerer has a plus two. He only needed a ten. Eight plus two is ten. Anyway, move on. So during the first two rounds, the players are actually doing surprisingly well, considering this is the state of the battlefield. Um, I cannot move these pieces around because I just can't. So you just have to like. You'll just have to envision all of this stuff. But basically, there's an ogre. There's one kobold. This kobold never participated in a battle. He was like a coward. He thought the rest of his buddies are gonna uh, kill the danger in, for him. Um, so yeah, they all converge on this point. And during those two fir first rounds, they are doing surprisingly well. The cleric has blessed them with a stream of d4s for a full minute. Uh, I mean, bless is obviously a good thing to do here. <laughs> they are connecting a lot of their attack rolls. They are hitting a lot of stuff. They are like killing a bunch. Of, they are, they kill a couple of goblins. Oh, a couple of kobolds. Again, I make it crystal clear that these uh, there are these two kobold inventors who are carrying a lot of weird shit on them that has metallic uh, wooden. Uh, clay, glass, like, ca there's cages, they have, like, bags, they have, like, these satchels and stuff like that on them. I'm, I, I just, I, I specifically described them more than these others, other ones. I'm dropping hints desperately at this point because I did pre-plan for something like this to happen, not in this ridiculous way, but I did, like, I wanted them to pick up on the hint that they can actually use these kobold inventors against the kobolds themselves. I'm dropping them like desperately left and right. I'm just hoping somebody picks up the hints and does something with them. So, the tiefling hexadin, the paladin uh, hexblade, is up front partially blocking the medium sized entrance where the wizard cleric burrowed uh, through with his mold earth cantrip. Uh, he has fire resistance he covers behind the intact section of the wall where those tiny holes were scattered around in between the boulders of the stones so like somewhere here 
Uh, this gives him like a three quarters cover uh, against anything other than like creatures that are standing right here. Um, or like here, obviously. Like this is like a little like limited range of, of, of line, lines of sight. So a dragon comes from somewhere around here, obviously in a round or two. Uh, cannot actually reach uh, fully here. Comes somewhere around here, like with 60 move speed. Um, casts fire breath. Uh, rolls like 22. Uh, the 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 hexaden tiefling saves. I I like I'm I'm thinking at this point if anybody else was there, it's a serious damage. For some reason, uh, a stroke of luck, the destiny, just like pure coincidence, the tiefling was out there first on the line of defense. I mean, Paladin kind of makes sense, but Tieflings are resistant to fire, and he rolled a good dexterity saving throw because he, he was in three quarters cover. So basically, he halved uh, that 22 damage to 11, and then re resisting uh, that 11 damage, he only took 5 fire damage out of that 22 fire damage that the dragon, like, breath, the, the fire breath into him, like th that, that cone. Uh, if you are wondering what it actually does, it's like right there. You can pause the video and watch later. Ten, basically, on average, 24 damage. 76 fire damage. It's a lot of damage. Basically, you, you fail a saving throw, you are dead. Basically. Basically. Um, yeah, this is a this is like a four times deadly encounter. Like, a lot of these things can kill them. <clears throat> but thing moves, things move on. Um... P five damage there. All the other players are basically just standing behind those barricades. Um, they're standing because the behind those barricades, they give them like half cover. They they are like flinging their range stuff. They're like short bows, rays of frost, eldritch blasts, whatever. Uh, they're trying to grab a hold of any of the players. Hey, oh, of course, uh, there's this like uh, ogre who comes lumbering here, completely blocks the path. Like, makes the giant mess, like, just completely blocks the entrance and blocks the line of sight. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the players have clear vision on him. So, the players are hitting the ogre. Uh, the For those, like, one, two rounds, the, the kobolds cannot actually do anything. And the players actually have a free kill on this ogre. Now... I actually didn't, like, I just didn't do it on purpose. I just played the creatures as they would play. They called for Ogre, obviously, to come from here. He came. Double move speed. Uh, 80, 80 uh, feet. He came here. He blocked the passage. Nobody else could pass. I mean, they could pass through. But there's, like, a giant blob of meat in front of them. So... At this point, like, the Kobolds are missing a lot of their shots from range because they don't have the pack tactics active. Uh, the players, on the other hand, are hurling a barrage of darts, rays, blasts, and arrows at the Ogre, killing him, like, slowly but surely. He finally dies. Uh, I roll a direction die openly in front of the players because this is a very, very large creature. He falls uh, here. He falls right here. He plops on top of these winged kobolds that are like huddled around here and are trying to fling rocks through these like tiny holes into the players that are standing somewhere around here. The players have like three quarters covered. They are not hitting anything. And he basically almost kills two of them and seriously, seriously wounds another one. Uh, so yeah. Basically, there's that. Then the players finally figure out that something's not right. It's finally. Uh, how can a 20 feet uh, high rubble collapse like that and lonely scatter, like, in this relatively small area? Like, a, a wall of that height and, like, all of this stuff, like, here. And it should be, like, all of this area, right? No, it's actually, like, only this area right here is, like, difficult terrain. They can see it clearly. Um, I tried to explain without revealing too much, but after a minute or two, I just give up uh, because they are logically, they're like sensing something. Uh, they are asking sound questions and their reasoning is like on point. So I just tell the cleric, I think, to roll or kind of check. He rolls fairly low. 
I think seven or nine. So he doesn't quite figure what's going on. Uh, but high enough to figure out that it definitely was some kind of magic holding that's like higher part, like hi the, the, the upper half of the wall holding it in place. <laughs> we settle the issue on that and move on. So now a kind of a lucky for players stalemate gets temporarily established for like a bit more time with Cobalt Priest and Cobalt Sorcerer missing hard on their Guided Bolts, Scorching Rays and Chromatic Orbs thanks to the cover provided by Rubble, Barricades, the like the, 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 the Cobalts in front of them and all of that stuff, like it's like a bottleneck here. Uh, the players are fully aware of how deep of a shit they are, uh, they are in now because they just witnessed two Two kobolds casting Guiding Bolt and Scorching Rays on them, which is like very powerful first and second level damaging spells. And they are very, very demoralized now. They are like quickly snowballing, in, snowballing into this like demoralized prospect of crushing defeat against the sheer number of kobolds that are just like swamping them with action economy, slowly piercing, bludgeoning, and... Uh, Spell casting away at their hit points. The dragon shields are a tough cookie to beat. They finally push through after like three or four rounds. They down the tiefling hex it into zero hit points. Surround the tiefling sorclock which is here. The few remaining fodder kobolds huddle around them here. They are flinging rocks. Uh, still though from that distance uh, from all of these barricades and stuff like that they have like most players have some form of cover or complete cover or even like just half cover so a lot of those are missing still uh, the players they are simply too high and uh, the kobolds are not landing too much but those kobold dragon shields with their two attacks per round and their pack tactics advantage they are slowly but surely chipping away at the sword clock. Uh, uh, for some reason, I do miss a lot though with them because, like, out of six or or eight or even ten attacks I had with them, uh, it was like six or eight. I only hit like three or four. Not four, definitely not four. Two or three attacks only. I I, I missed a bunch, even with advantage. Um, so uh, like he had like fourteen AC, and I just missed. I rolled everything, like most of my rolls, even on advantage, were below 10. So, the Red Dragon Wormling fails uh, to recharge his Fire Breath at the first round after he cast, but with the full, uh, full HP and a bunch of his minions rushing in uh, through the Mold Earth opening, he confidently flies inside himself, so he is now here, 5 feet... Uh, uh, away from the ground and starts biting at the players heads uh, Then the goblin bard ranger finally asks me uh, What did you say was that weird stuff that the kobold over there is carrying? Uh, pointing at the kobold inventor I said finally and I think to myself and instantly award him with like 50 bonus six points uh, experience points and proceed to describe the flasks the bags and all of that shit the Kobolds uh, carry on them. He decides to try and shoot one of those clay pots. I allow him. I increase the AC. He rolls about 20 on all of on both of those consecutive attack rolls in like uh, two rounds, uh, which is enough to hit what he is uh, trying to hit. Uh, and uh, basically, like uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of rot grubs and centipedes, which is like swarm of those nasty little critters, burst away and start swarming the nearby dragon shield. And now, uh, through some ridiculous attack rolls and high damage rolls, that dragon shield, like, he got, like, decimated. Like, his hit points plummeted down below 20 hit points from, like, 44. Just from those, like, uh, those road grubs. It was crazy, crazy luck for the players, because this, this seriously helped the players a lot. Um, it's looking hopeless at this point still because despite rolling horribly on my end, missing a lot of those pack tactics advantage attack rolls, just the sheer amount of attack rolls incoming Triton's way and slowly chipping away at other players, eventually downs the Triton 
Uh, Tifling is up again. Tifling Hexblade, like uh, Hexblade, Paladin Hexaden. But he's like at minimum HP with just enough hit points to live just one more round and then die again and just make a new character. In a sea of low hit points, easy picking Scobold surrounding him at that point. He gets up. He looks up. And there's one thing that in my mind and in his mind later on we agreed only makes sense for his character to do at that point. He leaps up. Attacks the dragon and hits it hard. Just a bit north of... Hit, like, the dragon is now just a bit north of 60 hit points. The tabaxi rogue sneaks below the dragon as well. Stabs it well below 40 hit points. Monk joins in from behind. Draws from his inner pool of key. Unleashes his flurry of blows. By some cosmic stroke of luck, uh, like three, uh, two out of his three attacks hit. The dragon's HP is now dangerously low, only 25 hit points. From like 68, 67 something to 25 in like a single round, a round and a half. The dragon is absolutely freaking terrified. L let me quickly go over here. Uh, look at this, this is like stock. This is like, you download this from uh, DM's guild. Uh, when, when, the, when it's reduced below to 15 or less hit points, he will flee. He will start fleeing. The dragon, the Catrax. And I'm thinking, the Catrax is not is that it's not a stupid creature. Uh, he's got like 12 intellect, 11 wisdom. He's he's a youngling, he's like a wormling. He's clever enough to figure out, oh shit, I'm gonna die. So what he does, the dragon is absolutely terrified at this point. From a seemingly inevitable victory, from his state of mind, from the dragon's state of mind. It is now in grave danger because it sees like three, four players attacking it all, uh, all at once. He uh, nerve-wrackingly, like an anxiously, fl maneuvers up, up to the ceiling. Players get their attacks of opportunity. Now remember, at all, all of this like time, he has a 17 ace. It's not, it's not an easy thing to hit. It's not an easy thing to hit 17 ace. It, it, you have, to, they have to roll high. They have to roll like 12s, 13s to hit. Um, unless, uh, instead of just like Hexed and Hexed and he has like, he rolled, but more than that, that's another, that's another story. He has plus 8 to hit. He's the only one. He can hit it semi-easily. He has like 50% chance to hit the dragon. All other players have like 30, uh, 35, I don't know, 25, 35. Uh, so... The, the dragon is like now, oh shit, the players take their attacks of opportunity, one miss, one hit, the, the monk is doing in and out thing with the drunken technique, he's like, he has disengaged for free, so he moves in, hits the dragon, moves up. Uh, the, the rogue and the hexaden hit the, uh, hit the dragon, one of them hits it, one of them doesn't. Uh, the dragon is now critically low, at 19 hit points, roaring in pain. As soon as it reaches the 20 feet high ceiling, it unleashes its freshly recharged fr uh, when it gets its turn. His fire breath recharges. I roll a 6. I shit you not. I roll the dice. I roll the, the, the 7d6. I roll 29 damage. I'm thinking, fuck. I'm gonna kill the players because the players are down below. Two players. Three players. Sorclock, the rogue, the... The paladin. Maybe, well, maybe the rogue disengaged with the bonus. I actually don't remember. I, I I can't remember vividly at this point. But I know there were two attacks of opportunity. I th I'm pretty sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Sorclock and the other Hexadin are down to zero hit points again. However, a bunch of kobolds surrounding the players. Like those kobold dragon shields. And those like shitty kobolds winged. And those, these ones. Um... They are, f like, doesn't matter. They have, like, five and seven hit points. They're all dead. Like, three or four of these are dead. Two Cobalt Dragon Shields with, with, like, chipped hit points. They are not at max. They fail their saving throw. One dies. The Rot Grub one with below 20 hit points dies. The other one is dangerously low. Like, five or ten hit points. However, there's, like, this Cobalt Inventor down below with, 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 uh, Alchemist's fire, a uh, uh, bunch of flammable shit on him. All of that shit explodes. 
like uh, in a huge 10 feet bubble because like it just combines in a huge like burst i roll a deck saving throw for that guy with like 10 or so hit points he fails a saving throw and i deal like 2d6 plus 1d4 damage something like po acid i don't know he dies he dies as well so now there's only one cobalt dragon shield left a very 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 damaged dragon shield like that's all like 15 20 hit points uh this like one of them saved um he was damaged before but he managed to save he was like 15 20 hit points the dragon is at 19 there's like cobalt priest and cobalt sorcerer at 27 hit points and that's it that is it like from this encounter right here which is quadruple deadly Literally, if you go here and, and, and do the maths, it's like... Oh, sorry. Uh, there you go. 3.96, it's like 4, basically. It turns into... Mm, what, 1? Mm, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, that, and... Uh, nope, nothing. This. This is now still dangerous <laughs> on, on paper but this one has like 15 19 hit points this one has 19 these ones like kobolds are scared like they're they're weaklings they're cowards and when they saw the dragon wormling killing like five or six of their brethren their kobold brethren right in front of them they're like oh shit themselves they are now free they are freaking out even though they have like a bunch of spell slots left they have a bunch of uh other things left they are scared and the players are the players know that because on in previous encounters before the final encounters the kobolds actually uh one one party of kobolds ran away so they start fleeing and from that point on, it's just snowball, like, uh, the single surviving dragon shield is two hits away from dying, basically, maybe three. He dies, it dies. The dragon is fleeing across the ceiling, but the kobold, uh, the kobold priest and the kobold sorcerer as well, like, disengage and book it. Uh, because they see their draconic overlord obliterating all of their remaining brethren and flying away in agony and pain. They start panicking hard, attempt fleeing in the fight. The, themselves because they're freaking out they just saw like a giant cone of fire killing everything like five six kobolds just dead in front of them queue up the monk's step of the wind and tabaxi's rogue uh 120 feet movement burst in a single turn nothing can really escape these two at these levels probably even like later on at higher levels because this shit right here he can just jump can jump like 10 feet in the air uh and like 30 feet in the in like long jump and 10 15 feet in the air something like that um the back sea can actually move like 120 feet so uh, these like these these uh these in a single round and then on on rounds after that 60 60 feet movement speed because move bonus action from rogue cunning action so it's like 60 feet plus attack so the priest and the sorcerer are definitely not gonna run away the dragon still has slight chance he has 60 move speed he has basically 120 move speed with the dash action single turn the the the, the monk charges in with the with the last five feet of his movement speed jumps up Hits the dra uh, cri critically hits rolls a natural twenty on a dragon. Lowers him, lowers the dragon down to ten hit points. The dragon is now basically like just like one or maybe two hit points, definitely away from being killed. Um, the cat and the, the goblin and the rest of the gang are slowly like picking up from the zero hit points, and who was alive prior to that. Chasing away at those sorcerer uh, and uh, priest kobolds. And 
long story short, the dragon dies next turn around. Those two kobolds die like in, in, in the seventh round or so. Because like they just hit him. And I'm thinking, I'm just watching and I'm, I don't know what to say. And uh, I'm thinking like, the, there, there was an open end scenario where like the dragon fleet f like fled, but obviously none of that happened. Um, I sort of like envisioned for the dragon to just flee to like run away, but the, the dragon obviously had no chance. Uh, and like er everything that moved in that cavernous system was just dead by the time the players finished like exploring around. So. Like at at the end, we were like we were we were having this talk, this like quadruple deadly encounter. Somehow, through like sheer luck, I they had luck. They rolled very very well, very well. I rolled very poorly on average, on those attack rolls and stuff like that. With a little bit of luck, a little bit of like. Clever play, tactical positioning as well. Like they really, they really milked those barriers, those like uh, difficult terrains, those half covers. They really milk, milked those. Um, and just at the last point, doing something that I actually didn't expect them to do. Like they legit, like surrounded by a bunch of like easily killable kobolds, like. Three or four of them, just like seven hit points, five hit points. I don't, I don't even know. They can kill them like in one shot. They just like decide, fuck it, we are going for the dragon. And obviously, the dragon doesn't want to die. <laughs> he, the dragon flees away, recharges that fire breath, and the dragon doesn't care. Like for the dragon, everybody is beneath him, even his like cobalt servants. He kills like indiscriminately. Because it's a red dragon. And basically kills the kobolds. Freaks out the remaining alive kobolds. Just like turns the in entire encounter upside down. Yeah and basically I was like this session. This entire session. Proved me ultimate, ultimately and utterly and completely how wrong I was in my assumptions. In my projections. In my like. Uh, what I envisioned for what's going to happen because all of my like thinking what's gonna happen and stuff like none of that actually kind of happened when it mattered but in the end I guess it was fun for the players after all they went through the emotional roller coaster of highs and they were desperate at one point like they were legit like angry at me because I put something in front of them that was legit unkillable seemingly um, and, but, like, after they figured out, like, the dragon is fleeing and, like, a bunch of kobolds are now dead, like, they instantly switched. It's like, it's like, it's basically a roller course. You, I, you, you could see on their eyes, like, yeah, fuck, we can do this, <laughs> you know. Okay, there is a way, you know, like, we have five, seven, three, two, I don't know, ten hit points each, but we can still do this, you know, and they chased away, they killed everything. And, yeah, I mean, I was quite engaged myself. Uh, it was a challenge running an encounter of this scope, like, with as many as seven different initiatives uh, being ran on the initiative tracker, like, 15 monsters in that encounter. Uh, like, 15, 16, I don't know. Lessons to take away. Uh, well, actually, running with seven different monster initiatives is too much time to go through, and it's definitely not something I'm going to... To repeat in the near time future unless like for some reason absolutely necessary uh also i could have easily ditched the many small weak kobolds like those winged kobolds i could have easily just ditched them and put those like uh, more powerful ones like kobolds uh kobold inventors and stuff like that uh i could have done that that would help me speed up the combat uh, two for initiatives, two to four initiatives for monsters seems like to be the sweet spot. Uh, obviously, the most glaring lesson of the f of the night is like, and the revelation, like that no matter how bulletproof you as a DM think, you make something like 
you are a DM, you're basically kind of like a god in your universe. But like you, you're a human. You cannot think of like a million ways that that your players can just subvert and completely ruin your designs and completely like blaze through your, I don't know, like complex uh, structures or machinations. It's just like one cantrip. It was one freaking cantrip, and it it was all it took. Like stupid, shitty little cantrip for 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 my like structure to just fall down and, and everything like falls down and it's just like obviously it's something that is it's a beast on its own and last but not least never underestimate the power of rng both ways in this case the players were very very lucky i told them during the fight and after the fight like luck was a a, a major element in like the final outcome of the battle because if I roll just one of those for example spells like ray of frost three ranged rolls I fail all three of them second uh, that's the only second level spell slot I had with that uh, cobalt sorcerer B uh, said the, the the other second level spell slot was used for uh, concentration um like the guided bolts and chromatic orbs like they missed the fire bolts missed all of them missed granted they had like three quarters cover and half covers but still man like just like if any of those on advantage just landed the critical hit it would have been all over for them just one of those rolls and they were like 15 20 30 of those rolls like it it it's crazy how much luck they had it, it I, th I don't think Something like that is gonna happen anytime soon. So you as a DM have to be wary that shit can happen. Because I was personally like... I witnessed the shit going on right in front of my eyes. So... Yeah, I mean... I basically on my side... I kind of wasted all of my... 18, 19 and 20 rolls on the D20... On initiatives... And then after all of my monsters were on like 20, 20 plus initiative, uh, they started rolling sub 10 rolls on D20s and basically unable to hit anything. And also never take your players for granted because sooner or later they will definitely do something you do not expect them to do. I, I mean, prior to this encounter, I knew that was a possibility, but I really thought like, God damn, like, if they figure out that there's, like, so many kobolds in front of them, they are surely gonna run away. But they didn't. They stood there. And they actually managed to defeat the encounter. Which, I, I at, at some point, like, th third or fourth round, I think it was, like, it was the lowest of the lowest. Like, everybody was dying, basically, like, three hit points. The one was in zero... Cleric has like two spell slots left. Um, uh, stuff like that. Like, I really thought, okay, it's gonna be a TPK, or at the very least, two or three of them are gonna legitimately die, make a new characters, and then we are gonna move on. And I'm gonna learn a lesson from that. But that didn't happen. Uh, all of those Cobalt Dragon Shields failed on their. Well, only one. I think hit on those advantage attack rolls, like roll 17. All the others were like 8, 6, 3, 5, 4, uh, 1, uh, 7, like everything was below 10 almost. And yeah, shit can happen. Shit can happen. Uh, I guess that's it for this video. This is a long video. Uh, obviously, it goes to the rant playlist. Um, just wanted to share. I thought I thought it was worthy of sharing because this is this just happened like 20 30 40 hours ago and uh, yeah if you watched the video until this point which is one hour and 45 minutes kudos to you bro you have you have nerves of steel you have more patience than i would have listening to my own self and if you're if you're here still just like drop that like share comment subscribe hit the bell button come again i am mostly releasing videos dealing with like builds particular character builds like optimizing min maxing 
power gaming sort of but from time to time videos like this are going to pop up on this channel when something funny or noteworthy or just valuable enough to share with the you the audience i come across so yeah that's about it min max munch king out and until next time uh, i guess talk to you soon